Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by my friends over at a company called Real Mushrooms, realmushrooms.com. Um, Sky Chilton and his father, Jeff Chilton. I interviewed Jeff a number of episodes ago. Uh, really interesting guys. I, I really enjoyed that conversation with Jeff. Um, and it's a company that sells and distributes medicinal mushrooms in powder or capsule form. Um, I was really happy to have these guys come on. Uh, I think they were very much in alignment with the the values of the podcast. Uh, As you all know, a big part of this podcast is uh, about uh, plant medicine, holistic medicine. And I I think the benefits of medicinal mushrooms are are truly fantastic. And I think there's really a growing body of work uh, that's really showing and alluding to all of the amazing properties that mushrooms have. Um, They sell a lot of different mushrooms, um, things you've probably heard of like reishi, chaga, lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps. Um, those are all mushrooms I work with. They, they're, they're part of uh, what I consider uh, for myself a, a really holistic uh, supplement regime. Um, and the, the thing I really love about their company, not only are they really good guys, I think they're really ethical guys, um, but um, the, the product is really amazing. It's all uh, 100% mushrooms. They're organic. Uh, and, and that's really rare. For better or for worse, the supplement in this industry is, is highly unregulated. Um, and so often when you get supplements, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. You may be getting some mushroom. You may be getting a bunch of fillers and other things. Oftentimes, even when you're buying what may be a mushroom. It may not have any of that mushroom in it at all, unfortunately. Uh, even some of the big, uh, I think even the biggest company that, that sells mushrooms, actually it's not the fruiting body, not the mushroom itself. It's the mycelial, which is grown on grain, and then those things are mixed up and then sold in a supplement form. So not only are you not getting the mushroom itself, you're getting the mycelium uh, mixed with grain. So um, it's one of the amazing things of real mushrooms is it's exactly that. It's real mushrooms. So it's 100% mushrooms, organic. So you know you're getting a really good uh, product. You're getting the actual fruiting body, the, the mushroom itself, 100% of that. Um, and again, just really great guys. I'm, I'm really happy to have them on and supporting this podcast. Uh, so if you'd like a really good product, uh, you'd like to start working with medicinal mushrooms, um, check out their site, realmushrooms.com. Um, and also listeners of the show. Uh, if you go to their site, realmushrooms.com forward slash universe, you get 25% off your first order, uh, which is a really good deal. And I think once you uh, uh, start working and, and tasting their products, you'll you'll really uh, see and feel a big difference. So uh, thank you to them. And uh, I think that's it. And without further ado, here is the intro to the show. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Tony Moss. Tony is a really interesting guy. I've known about him for a while. As we spoke about on the podcast, he originally became uh, interested in in plant medicine work, specifically with ayahuasca, I believe about 35 years ago. So he's been doing this work and kind of in and around involved in this work for, for quite a long time, a number of decades now. So it was really a pleasure to sit down with him and, and get to know him a little bit, to have him share in his wisdom. He's also a very talented musician, and uh, that was a lot of what the conversation revolved around was uh, about plant medicine, specifically ayahuasca, and the role that uh, music has to play in that um, for, for traditional indigenous cultures and traditions around the world. Music is always a, a very big part of, of this plant medicine work. So it's a really fascinating symbiosis, which we talked about. We talked about his work, his journey. Um, we talked about the role of myth, of storytelling. We got into to things like Carl Jung and, and Joseph Campbell, which is always, uh, for me, really fascinating conversations. And then also this idea about uh, eldership and apprenticeship. Um, so it was a, a really beautiful conversation, and I, I think you all will, will gain a lot from this episode. As always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good option. It's a website. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers that you can sign up for, and those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Um, as always, to all of the people supporting via Patreon, thank you very much 
much for your your help and your support. It's really what allows me to continue making these episodes. And if you're able to do that, if you feel like you're gaining something from this podcast, that's a um, a really invaluable way to to help to support it. If you're not able to do that, as always, doing some of the little things really help to drive the algorithms get to get the show out to a bigger audience. So if you're viewing this on YouTube or Rumble. Uh, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video. Uh, those things are all a, a really big help. Uh, one quick note on that with Rumble, uh, there used to be an automatic transfer from YouTube uh, to Rumble, so it was quite easy, uh, but they're actually in some sort of dispute right now, and so the videos haven't been uh, automatically trans uh, transferring to Rumble. So I haven't had a chance to to, to upload probably the last... I don't know, five or six episodes to Rumble, but hopefully when I get some time, I can begin to do that. So if you are listening on Rumble, uh, apologies that some of the newer episodes haven't been uploaded there, but uh, hopefully that will happen soon. Um, and if you're listening to this on, on whatever platform, um, Spotify and Apple Podcasts are still the big ones. If you can leave a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. So uh, I think that's it. In terms of my own personal work, I just finished a, a dieta, a plant medicine retreat here in Portugal. Um, we have one upcoming in August in Canada. Uh, I believe it's sold out, although we had to change venues, so we may be able to accommodate a, a couple more people with camping uh, for that retreat, although there, there may be a room uh, still available. But uh, um, after that, we also just announced that we'll be back in the Sacred Valley of Peru in November uh, for three weeks. So uh, if you're interested in, in, in working with myself or my colleague Marav Artsy and, and going deeper into the world of plants, those are really beautiful opportunities. Uh, you can learn more on my website, which is nicotianarustica.org and Marav's site, tobaccodiets.com. And I'll put a link to, to both of those in the show notes. So I think that's it for the intro. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Tony Moss. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out from the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Great, great. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you for coming on. Uh, as I kind of mentioned before we started, you'd, you'd been on my radar for a while. I, I think you were recommended to me by, by maybe a couple listeners of the show, or I, I can't remember exactly how it came up, but uh, recently I started doing a little research on you and you're a really interesting guy and you've, you've been around this kind of this field or this work for a long time. I would imagine that actually quite a few of the listeners have, have probably heard of you. They're, they're maybe familiar with you, your, your work, your music, uh, and, and I would imagine some haven't. So I know this is always a, a big leading question, but uh, maybe you can give the audience a, a bit of your, your background, who you are, and, and, and what brought you to, to this kind of realm of work that you're into now. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, um, like a lot of people, the first time I was invited to a a plant medicine ceremony. It was ayahuasca. I literally said, "Aya what?" Like I'd never heard of it. And uh, but I was just in this very open, you know, moment in my life of exploration. And I trusted the guy that invited us. So you know, two friends and I, we went to this uh, first ceremony, and uh, turned out to be the Santo Daime, which is a Judeo-Christian ayahuasca church out of Brazil. And although I pretty much hated every minute of that experience. 30 years later is what I do. <laughs> so it was uh, uh, as challenging and difficult and foreign as it was, uh, as profound the impact was the weeks following the ceremony, which is why I ended up going back, because I was kind of curious to understand what happened to me for the most part, which is, you know, your listeners know, was just this very rapid kind of uh, consciousness expanding yeah, period following the ceremony. Yeah, and I was all in. So prior to that, I was doing musical theater professionally and early stages of recording music. Um, ayahuasca interrupted that completely, and I thought I was done with it. But uh, lo and behold, you know, it came back 
hurling with a vengeance that it's actually like how I wanted to utilize those skills and that talent. And that was starting to kind of switch all of my music writing and production to this, uh, at, at the time, completely new genre called medicine music. Right? So that's what I'm known for now. Um, and in my case, very contemporary um, take on traditional medicine music. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. So you were, you were a musician, you were in a musical theater before you came to plant medicine. Yeah. 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 And uh, the interesting thing about, you know, the, the timing, whenever this happens, you know, there's this phrase, you know, that uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. You know, I, the interesting thing was I was doing musical theater and in this interesting phase that was uh, basically me kind of being disillusioned by it and starting to realize that, you know, it wasn't uh, satisfying, at least not anymore. Um, prior to being introduced to plant medicines and the entire world of shamanism and psychedelic healing, you know, my trajectory was very clear. I was going to go to New York, which I was invited to do, and get a Tony Award. Like, that was it. You know, life was good, and that was probably about as far-reaching a goal as I had. And prior to this ayahuasca introduction, I remember the last year or so just becoming acutely aware that that may not be what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I didn't know what else I was going to do, but I knew that that was not as satisfying as I thought it would be. Yeah, so when this opened up, it was just the... I was just this, this perfect window of receptivity, basically. You know, the, I would say the kind of spiritual journey, although it had begun, that was the moment when it was kind of like the rubber meets the road. It wasn't just interesting side reading at that point. I was all in, you know, the, every part of me knew that it was time to move into whatever the next phase of my life was going to be. So, yeah, I didn't know what it would be again, but I knew that working with plant medicines and psychedelics relative to therapy and, yeah, kind of spiritual expansion, I knew that that was on the radar for sure. And, it, I mean, I, I can only guess your age, uh, but, you know, not to, not to say one thing one way or the other, but, I mean, I, I would imagine it, it sounds like that was at a younger point in your life, and I, oh, I would yeah. imagine it. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I think, mm, yeah, my first eye experience, I was 30 or 31. Yeah, and as we're recording, I'm 61. So, okay. you know, there's a lot of ground to cover in there. But in a nutshell, you know, I spent two or three years working with the Santo Daime Church because at the time I really didn't know there was any other access to uh, ayahuasca. And the world of shamanism in general had not really... Uh, that and the work of Carl Jung, they weren't on my radar at the time. Um, and within a few years of working with the Santo Daime Church, I got introduced to a uh, now famous curandero who is traveling back and forth to the U.S. And someone recommended that I be his guardian, his like uh, assistant. And that's when I got my training and the world of you know more indigenous use of ayahuasca and their indigenous approach to emotional, psychological, and physical healing, that's when that world opened up and I just dove in as a study. Yeah, and then it from there ended up working with not only the Mestizo uh, Curanderos, but traveled to Peru to study with the Shipibo, eventually the Yawanawa, the Hunikuan, a group out of Ecuador called the Siakupai. Yeah, various ayahuasca conferences and yeah, and at some point, once I felt I had a really firm understanding and grip on that world and what the medicine was doing and how it overlapped with Western understandings of everything from epigenetics to, yeah, mental health in general, yeah, I slowly got invited to facilitate ceremonies. And um, I would say somewhere maybe around 15 years ago, it was pretty clear that was going to be the trajectory for the rest of my life. Yeah. And around that same time, realizing that I did, in fact, want to continue a career also as a recording artist, but now with a focus on psychotherapeutic work and what we're calling medicine music. Yeah. So, so 30, thir 35 years ago or something, uh, I mean, there, there would have been almost no kind of collective knowledge, especially in the U.S., I, I think of ayahuasca. I mean, what... 
how, how did that present itself to you at, at that time? It was such, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I, I came right into the, the field and the world of plant medicine and psychedelics at the beginning of what would later be called the psychedelic renaissance. And I didn't know it. Um, but having been in it so long, it's been absolutely fascinating to watch this transition take place. So, yeah, so when I went to my first ceremony, although the internet was around, we weren't on it. You know, like there were things happening and people were kind of fooling around, but it was nothing even remote to what it is now. So it would, there was no like Google, right? So when this guy said, do you want to come to an ayahuasca ceremony? The best you could do is maybe go to the Bodhi tree and find an article <laughs> in a magazine or something and try to figure out what this thing was. So we went in pretty blind, you know. Um, and the interesting, I think the thing that I'm most kind of like been reflecting on lately is the the various groups that I got to sit with and later facilitate, um, we began this whole conversation around how to adapt the indigenous approach to in my case, ayahuasca ceremony, so they would be more accessible and more potent for Western consciousness. And ironically, things that are now really like stable parts of ayahuasca ceremonies worldwide were things at the time that we were all kind of collectively inventing in terms of them being a ongoing, like, normal part of what an ayahuasca ceremony looks like. For instance, orientation. The first time I did an ayahuasca ceremony, there was no orientation. It's hard to imagine, right? But back then, again, you know, I think there was like a, uh, there was a photocopy of a couple of articles from a shaman's drum magazine, but no one actually sat everybody down and said, you know, this is what you're about to experience. Here's the best way to navigate the experience. You know, so early on, you know, when I started facilitating my, uh, partner and I in that work, we created what all of that would look like, should look like, started stressing and preaching the importance of integration and uh, what that looked like, particularly for Western people. You know, an example of why the differences are important. If you go to Peru or you're any foreign place and you're doing ayahuasca, your integration is going to look very different because you're still in the place where it took place and you're most likely on kind of vacation versus being someplace in the U.S. where it's most likely going to be a weekend retreat and Monday morning you're back to work. So it's a very different approach to integration. And even the definition of what integration means here looks a lot different. You know, so, so lo and behold, over the last 30 years, that has completely changed. Now, you know, you can't talk about ayahuasca without talking about orientation and the importance of integration, right? And early on starting to realize like the work of Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung and particularly how those things map themselves so beautifully with the ayahuasca experience, how to understand it and approach it. Um, that then, you know, depth psychology, basically back then those things were really unique and kind of novel, you know, and, and sometimes to the annoyance of the indigenous and Brazilian folks that we were working with. You know, for them, it's kind of like, oh, you Western people, you want to talk about everything. You know, everything has to be academic. Like, that's not what we're saying at all. Like, I go, these guys are saying exactly what you're saying. And to some degree, they understand the work you're doing even better than you do. Right. In terms of like shadow work, archetypes, you know, all the various things that come with that territory. Um, yeah. So it was it was a really cool period of feeling like we were actually contributing to what was going to eventually be this phenomenon of ayahuasca in the West, basically. Yeah. So you were you were doing musical theater and and a musician, and when you began working with, I guess it was predominantly ayahuasca that you were working with, uh, yeah. I think in the beginning and, and mostly throughout your life. I, I experimented with everything that came along, you know, um, just to understand, have a, a deeper understanding of the world of plant medicine and psychedelic therapy. But it was very clearly on that I was going to be married to ayahuasca. Like it was kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did that? Was there like some eureka moment? Because you mentioned this idea of, of medicine music. Was was there something that that kind of like led you to feel like that became your path, or it was just something organic that began to be infused with your music? 
It was both. It was organic in that the Santo Daime uh, ceremonies are music driven. You know, for them, they say the the teachings of the Santo Daime as a religion, the quote unquote doctrine, is all in the hymns, right? So they have hymnodials, and there's no talking or anybody like preaching anything. You just sing the hymns, and you're getting all the the messages they would want you to. So I early on started to realize the the power of not only the flavor and the cadence and the tone and the harmony and that all of the structure of the music was super important and how it was interacting with your neural network and the psyche, but also for better or worse, the how important the lyrics were in terms of the open kind of psychic space that people were in. Like everyone was like highly suggestible, right? So yeah, so what was being said and shared was really important. And um one of the problems I had with the Santo Daime, and I still love the Santo Daime overall, beautiful people, you know, the services are beautiful. Um, however, if you're not interested in the Judeo-Christian doctrine and you're in this, you know, beautiful open space, um, there's a lot of things being shared and said that just kind of like pull you out of your own personal exploration, right? Yeah, you know, needing to focus on things like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, or a few of the hymns to me were just actually, from my point of view, actually almost inappropriate to sing in that space. And it was so minor that it didn't keep me from enjoying and or wanting to criticize the work, but it was always on my radar. So at some point, my uh, partner and I, um, you know, we we said, you know, we have a lot of friends who are really interested in ayahuasca. It was starting to become popular, but they're not interested in a Judeo-Christian doctrine approach to it. And we started thinking, you know, we should formulate this other thing where we're kind of bringing together the best of the indigenous traditions that we have encountered with what we've learned about holding space and structure of ceremony from the Santo Daime. And that's what we eventually did. Yeah. So it was within that, getting back to your question, that... I knew what was going to be absolutely fundamental to anything that I wanted to do with uh, therapy and psychotherapy to work with ayahuasca had to be music centered because by then I realized that was the most potent like driving force. Yeah, the medicine in concert with music and in concert with a well-structured ceremony, that's what makes it so powerful. Yeah, and I was starting to kind of be through the beautiful creative space that ayahuasca puts you into. I was starting to, yeah, kind of hear and receive and conceive of lots of different songs that I didn't know at the time would actually be medicine music because they didn't fit the traditional model of it at the, at the time. But once we had the format of our own circle and I could start interjecting these songs, it became really clear really fast that we were on to something in terms of, yeah, and by the way, this isn't something I invented. You know, I was just late to the game in reality in terms of like the power of medicine music and this whole new genre of medicine music that was coming out of places like Sacred Valley in Peru, for instance, where a lot of young people were holding ceremonies there, absolutely with integrity, people they had studied with, but pushing the needle forward in terms of like what medicine music sounded like. I just took it into a different direction. And it was an obvious one because I have a, you know, um, not only musical theater, but, you know, soul and rhythm and blues background and gospel music and that was a, a natural extension of that type of spiritual music uh, would come through me in ceremony because it's my cultural background. Right? Yeah, so eventually uh, we formulated the group Bird Tribe, recorded uh, an album. I'd done a few singles prior to that. We recorded the Bird Tribe album, which is called Birds in Paradise, and it took off. Like It was... It was uh, beautiful and rewarding and surprising because we actually kind of thought we're going to, you know, really do the best. I produced that album. I said, we're going to do the best possible production available to us, but of medicine music. And um, we knew for sure that we had an audience, you know, small community within the plant medicine world that would appreciate it. And it was overwhelming. It actually took off. And yeah, I would still say probably most of our listeners are people that are related to this world because they contact me all the time. But I also get people, this is the power and the testament of medicine music. I get messages at least, you know, two or three a month of someone saying something like, you don't know me, I stumbled across your song Grateful on YouTube and 
prior to that, I was in a deep depression. I was thinking, having suicidal ideations. And I listened to this song every day and it's pulled me out of that space. That's the power of the medicine music. You know, once I started getting those messages, I was like, this is it. Like, whether I work with ayahuasca or not for the rest of my life, I'm positively going to be focused on medicine music. Right. And, you know, over the last 12 years or so, I've really delved into the, the, I would say to some degree, still new um, science of the healing powers of both sound and music, you know, and then looking at that, how we apply it to the ceremony space, it helped us to refine what it is that we're doing, when we're doing it, how we do it. Yeah, it's been a really beautiful journey. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting because I, I I would imagine you mentioned a lot of different uh, indigenous groups in South America and the the, the Amazon, the, the Shipibo, the Huni Queen, mm -hmm. um, in in all of those traditions, music sound is is very important uh, for the Shipibo, whether it's through the voice, through the Huni Queen, with with their music, with their words. So music is a big part of, of that traditional medicine experience. And, and, and I think even for the layman, I mean, it, I think everyone realizes that, that music moves people. I mean, even as you mentioned, I mean, some people, it can literally pull them out of despair, out of desperation. And you, you mentioned even, I mean, it's interesting, some of this music that you refer to like gospel, I mean, there, there's, it's literally religious in the name or, you know, rhythm, blues. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was reminded of the Vedas, which is potentially, according to some, the most ancient knowledge, and it's sung, and it's it's sung exactly. in a very particular way that, that evokes, uh, you know, many different things. Why, I mean, this is maybe a, a big question, but, but why do you think that music is so important in conjunction with, with plant medicine? Because it, it's, it's quite rare. I mean, you know, I, I've also worked with Iboga and I mean, music is a huge part of that. It, yeah. It's, uh, I was actually at a conference, um, it, it might have been maps or something, but it, it was someone who was speaking about Ibogaine, a, a Westerner, and a, a guy stood up from the audience and he said, you know, you're speaking about Ibogaine, but I was just curious, like, what do you think of the role of the, the shaman, the, the music? Because I went through that experience and I found like the music really, really shaped me. It was a huge part of the experience. And, and this woman, she, she kind of brushed it off and she's like, well, well, we don't, we don't work with those kind of things, you know, as if they weren't important. And, and in that more traditional setting, that, that music is really integral to the experience. So is there something as a musician that, that you felt or, or you began to see like the, the, the power of music in those spaces? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that deserves like a 12 part podcast <laughs> in and of itself. The, I think the most basic foundational things to share about that, one is relative to psychotherapeutic therapy and plant medicine ceremonies. The first and most fundamental thing is that music bypasses the intellect. That's why it's so potent and beautiful. It's a language that we understand. It's a language of the heart, obviously. Um, And it triggers deep culturally embedded everything from nostalgia to trauma, which is why it's so valuable. You know, um, I tend to think in, in these terms of most of the things that people are coming to therapists or to plant medicines to heal are things that are in the subconscious, meaning in this context, things that for whatever reasons have been intentionally buried and suppressed. And we don't have through regular conversation or just recall access to these things, but music does, right? Yeah, certain melodies, drumming, of course, um, yeah, rhythm and cadence. Yeah, all of those things can like, trigger and unlock parts of our psyche and emotions and so forth that we just don't normally have access to. And they put us in this beautiful open space where everything related to that thing can actually surface and be seen or be exposed and, you know, experienced. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm giving very layman's terms about this because I've actually studied the whole thing, but I'm really speaking more from the direct experience, kind of anecdotally from being in ceremony, you know, that you know, I sing a song like Grateful and Ceremony, and 
you know, it's just the importance of being grateful, but just sung in a way that is never like a teaching per se. It's just the value of waking up in the morning and hearing birds singing and being grateful that you've loved and lived at all. It's really rare that that song is not played or sung in ceremony that half the room doesn't start crying, right? Um yeah, because it triggers the most obvious things that you just don't have access to. And it's like, I, example, you know, one of the things I share all the time is that the answer to most of our so-called problems is actually just gratitude, right? So if you just hear that, like somebody's just listening to me say it now, it's like, uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's true. That's very different. It's a, a visceral and somatic experience when you hear it sung to you in ceremony and you actually realize that the answer to whatever it is you came to the ceremony for is actually just gratitude for what you have already, right? Or living in a state of gratitude and the value of it. So I think that's why the music is so key. And again, it's ability to kind of bypass the intellect and communicate to different parts of us. And the, in my case, I, I'm glad you brought up, you know, like gospel, blues, a lot of indigenous music, you know, a lot of Americana. This is music that was by and large born from pain and suffering. That's where it's coming from, right? So when you hear that or anything that kind of like leans into that direction, same thing happens. It triggers those things inside of us. We all care. We now know, you know, scientifically that we're carrying the traumas of our ancestors to what degree we don't know. But the science seems to be revealing in research more and more every year. I just read an article yesterday. Um, <laughs> kind of uh, affirming something that we actually heard 20 years ago, which is each of, each of us carries in our DNA the, you know, the traumas that your ancestors experienced. And in addition to that, just the immediate traumas, let's say like the baggage that you got from your abusive father or neglected mother, whatever the thing is, nothing is more effective at triggering those things and offering a, like a container to hold them and process them or grieve through them than music does. You know? Yeah. So I've often said to people that are like wanting to train to facilitate, you know, this part of our conversation is the thing that I share with them. I say, you know, when you really understand the power of music and the role that it plays with human beings in general, but particularly in that space, and you're going to be much more effective at what you're doing. Right. There's not a lot of, I think a lot of young people go to Peru, wherever they experience ayahuasca, they study with a particular teacher, and they have this idea that what they're learning is like a lot of magical shamanic hocus pocus, right? And technologies and tools, and yes, your teacher's responsibility is to teach you those things. But I said, however, in ceremony, your main job is to hold the space so that the medicine and the music can do its job, basically. And those tools come into play when they're needed, not as something that's necessary for the transformation process to take place. But you, if you're in a ceremony and you're having a difficult time or someone else in the room is, you definitely want a facilitator that has experience and has trained and understands all the ins and outs and the technologies. Um, we like to refer to them as technologies, you know, and the wisdom that their teachers have taught them. But in general, that's not what's happening. In general, it's like uh, strong orientation, teach people how to navigate the experience, depending on the kind of session it is, choosing appropriate music for it, you know, and then what we call holding a really tight container, like the, the space that the ceremony can unfold in, that it's safe, you know, that the crew that you're working with has experience, they know what they're doing, and people feel really safe and comfortable, you know, to kind of dive in and go deep. You can pretty much rely on the music in concert with the medicine to do the job. Yeah. In fact, almost anything you put on top of that is typically more of an interference, if anything. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, you've had a lot of experience yourself. Does that ring true to your own experience? Uh, certainly. I, I mean, you know, kind, kind of, as you said, there, there's, there, there's also just so many traditions, so many different ways of working. And, right. and, and I think to, you know, always when speaking with these things, it's it's difficult to speak in, in super broad terms because things can be so different too. The, the intentions that people are coming with, the set, right. the setting. You know, and as you know, I mean, certain individuals, certain groups have very strong ideas as well. <laughs> you know, who, who's to say if they're right? And uh, but but I think that's where it's really important is is to really honor that that space and 
like like anything you know i do martial arts so if i'm if i'm going to go to a certain jujitsu school like i i better respect the the rules of, of that school and 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 at the same time i mean i you know i think something that, that's really interesting that you're doing that, that i think a lot of people really feel called to you know and and you mentioned this thing this idea of uh, it's interesting that there, there's a, there's a teacher who I had, his name is Amika. He comes from the, the Colombian Amazon, a group of people called the Tubu people. Amika is actually his title, but he said, we, we live in this time of the Dirdo Amasa. It's, it's the children of the new dawn. And it's the people who can really bridge the medicine of the four directions to, to create a new earth. And I think there's, there's something very powerful about it. And and it's even interesting because he, he used to say he, he would listen to his grandfather speak that, that this time was coming, but he thought, well, that's just rubbish. I mean, who are these people? I mean, you know, we, we all look the same. We're the same skin color, same hair color. And he said his grandfather told him, no, there's going to be a time where you're going to see people who uh, have white skin, who have black skin, who have thick hair, who have thin hair, who have blue eyes, black eyes, green eyes. And he's like, that's crazy. It's just we're the people, you know, how is that even possible? Yeah, but you know, certainly he then then he started to to see that. But you know, I think one of the really interesting things about that prophecy is that it speaks about this idea of taking the medicine of the four directions, and that it's not that you know even inherently one direction is is better or worse, but that that every direction has medicine, and and I think that's one of the really interesting things you were doing, and you know, even this idea of, um. W like you were speaking of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and, and, and also this idea of traditional societies. And, and it's interesting because even in traditional societies, I mean, we, we tend to look at them as somehow stagnant or, or stuck right. in time. And yet they're constantly changing too. I mean, I was just having the conversation of a, of a friend of mine the other day, and he was working with a young Shipibo uh, Curandero. And he was saying, your, your music sounds like hip hop music. Like how, how is that happening? Uh, is it, I mean, just making this up. I mean, this doesn't sound, like you know quote unquote shipibo music and and this happened for months and finally he sat down and talked to him and he's like like what are you singing and he, he's like it sounds like hip-hop and he's like oh yeah i, I love hip-hop i that's it's a big, big part of my music now <laughs> and he was just so shocked you know but um but i mean that, that's also one of the interesting things is like what what is that for you because you i think you're a really interesting guy in that way that that you come from the us you come from a you know even la it's often considered a certain culture in and of itself so you're you're bridging that you're you're bridging your own story but you also really seem to have a, a real deep interest in a lot of these these traditional shamanic cultures and yet at the same time you're also playing that role of the dear Amazon where you are bridging these things like how do you how do you balance that like you know i think a lot of people listening to this it kind of as you were saying they, they may come from a particular tradition which is great and maybe they really hold on to that and they they you know for all the good the bad the, the dogma the beauty of that um, but I think it's very difficult also, and, and, and it can be problematic, you know, when people begin to kind of pick and choose what, what they want and, and leave things away. But, but how do you find that balance of, of really honoring the traditions while at the same time, you know, taking medicine of, of the West or, or of your roots, of, of, of who you are, of, of these really beautiful things? You know, like, like you said, people often disregard someone like Joseph Campbell or, or Carl Jung, but, but they were, in a way, shamans of themselves. They were shamans of story, Great. shamans of word. Absolutely shamans for the West. Mm -hmm. And I would say now shamans for the world. Yeah, I just love everything you brought up, particularly this concept of bridging, you know, the four directions. Um, yeah, make no mistake about it. I say this all the time. What I'm doing, I refer to as neo-shamanic, as a new shamanism. Very aware of it. It is by design. It is calculated and studied. And occasionally, people who don't have a full understanding of people who are doing that work will say things like, well, you're just picking and choosing. Well, the answer is yes, but, but they're conscious, intelligent, studied picking and choosing. And to answer your question, you know, um, I studied with those groups because I, I wanted to fully, before changing anything or wanting to adapt or modify something, I wanted to understand what it was, you know, like at, at, at my background in theater and music helped in this sense. I remember both in art and music school early on, there would always be a, a mindset amongst some young people that weren't interested in what 
the traditional art form was, you know, what the masters were doing, whatever it is. They just wanted to create new. And the, my instructors would always say something to this effect. They go, in order for you to leap forward and create whatever it is that's new, you first need to understand what has come in the past, right? The foundations of color theory and, you know, uh, perspective and drawing and things like that. Understand how it evolved, why certain things were in place the way they were. Same thing goes for music. When you have a deep, beautiful understanding of that, it's from that, that's your launching place into creating something incredibly new, like your unique expression and gift to the world. It's absolutely no different with the plant medicine worker and shamanism. I knew early on because of that background that if I was going to do this, and I'm just this kind of person, I'm like, if I want to offer something to people, I want to fully understand it. You know, I want to understand the foundations, why things are the way they are, how they evolve, where they came from. So I went into a good five, ultimately like 10 year study period of everything from what were the roots of ceremony in general? And lo and behold, to my surprise, the roots of ceremony will actually reverse. It turns out that theater started a ceremony, which was interesting. That's what I was doing for a living. You know, it was the indigenous and traditional people's uh, ceremonial practices that slowly evolved into what became kind of morality theater. Um, so how I bridge those is I look at, once you have a deep understanding of why they do something like Ikaros, like the role of Ikaros in the Shipibo ayahuasca tradition, once you understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, when and where and all of that, you can actually adapt it and like, oh, we can have the same effect, achieve the same thing, but with music that will be more accessible for Western people. And that has proven to be true. When I work with the Shipibo, I remember asking them once about the, the, uh, the Icaros and their role. And I've said this many times in public because it was so profound to me at the time. They said, well, we acknowledge that ayahuasca is the true healer, you know, the true shaman. However, the Icaros direct it and tell it where to go. Right? I really liked that. And then once I was sitting, I was doing a dieta with Manuela Manuel. She's a, a long tradition of uh, healers out of Peru. And we were doing like a month-long plant dieta with a tree called New Yarao. And at some point in one of like the third ceremony in, someone asked if it was okay to sing along. And the Western person that was just assisting answered, oh yeah, you can, but make sure it's in Shipibo and make sure that, you know, it's following what she's doing. And someone translated that answer to her. She said, no, 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 no. She said, I'm singing to you in Shipibo because it's the only thing I can sing to you in. She said, if I could sing to you in English, I would. And I was really struck by that because it kind of validated what we were feeling too. This idea of bypassing the intellect that I brought up earlier, if you're sitting in the Shipibo, you know, Hunikuin or Yamanawa ceremony, you don't need to understand the language for the impact of those Ikaros and the, the chants and the music, the medicine music to work. Right, we all know from those experiences. Um, however, some of the things you're saying are so valuable in that moment to your teaching. You know, to suddenly hear a lyric pop out that says something like, "One of the songs we do, uh, the lyric is, uh, Dear me, I forgive you." Right? If you suddenly hear that in English, the language that you're that's native, right, and then the what's happening melodically is supporting the emotional terrain of that. That's a really deep trigger for inquiry. It's like, yeah, deep self-forgiveness, you know, that's probably the main thing that I'm needing in this moment. Or the most important thing that I can get from this particular ceremony is looking at the whole study around self-forgiveness, what it actually means. What what am I forgiving? Why do I even think that I need to? Like all of it unfolds in that moment. So it's just an example of how important it is that what I'm calling the neo-shamanic approach is. It's not negating the indigenous time-tested and proven traditions. It's not saying that uh, we're evolving it because we think it's better. It's really just an adaptation, right? Um, so in the ceremonies that I facilitate, we always start with traditional Icaros and what have become more like mestizo traditional, like opening chants that are kind of, they're setting the tone. We're putting the medicine work in a context. 
you know, in my case, mostly Shipibo, because that's the group I predominantly studied with. And then we slowly morph out of that into more traditional contemporary medicine music. And it works really, really beautifully. And we stress to people all the time, you know, the absolute importance of understanding and acknowledging that we are participating in and adapting, again, a time-tested, in a lot of cases, ancient modality of healing and transformation that works, right? So we're not trying to uh, add or subtract, we're just adapting. Yeah. So for you, uh, this is kind of another big question, but but what is what does medicine music mean to you? Uh, how is that different from, from music that people would, would turn on the radio and listen to? Uh, is it... Is it guided by, for you, the experiences you've had with medicine? With uh, You mentioned this idea of the ikardos, uh, because usually they, they have a certain structure. They're invoking certain things. Is it kind of a, a combination of different things that, that, for you, makes that song a medicine song? Yeah, I get asked this all the time, because my uh, our music label, it's called I Am Life. You know, it's medicine music, and people ask, well, what is it? So I have two responses. Uh, First, any song that is healing for you is medicine music. You know, I remember growing up, and there was this popular, I, it's still around, I don't listen to it anymore, but it was like, remember, like, Coast Radio, like, Coast to whatever the, the name, the numbers were. And it was always, to me, like, oh, my gosh, turn off that station. It's like this really sappy, love songy music. And, well, that was true until I had my first heartbreak, right? So I remember, yeah, a relationship that ended really badly, you know, and I was driving along, I think I was going to Northern California, and the only station that I got reception for was Coast. And suddenly these songs that I thought were really like cheesy, silly love songs spoke to me. And I realized, oh my gosh, these people were writing from direct experience. They were actually, these songs are about a spectrum of human experience and emotion that I just hadn't had up until that time period. So I couldn't relate to it. So the reason I share that is any music, you know, you can be driving along and hearing a Justin Timberlake song and suddenly that thing triggers some kind of quote unquote healing within you. Then in that moment, that music is medicine for you. Right. So any music can be medicine music. However, the genre of medicine music is music that is either created from or specifically for ceremony work or psychedelic therapy. That's the difference. Right. So. Medicine music as a genre, as Western people will now all over the world, we speak of it today, you're referring to music that is appropriate for or conceived for and in ceremony spaces, right? It, its whole purpose is to support that work, right? By its design and intention, it's meant to actually be medicine music. Right? Um, yeah, and for me, that just came because of my background, both with the power of uh, music. The beautiful thing about musical theater, the music of musical theater, is that its whole role is to... So there's a rule like uh, in musical theater, and particularly when they try to adapt it to film. If the song comes out of nowhere, it strikes you as stupid, right? It's like all of a sudden they've, they've been talking and now they're doing a song. Um, it's because it's not utilized correctly. What they say in the world of musical theater particularly, again, as it adapts to film, is that a song comes in when the emotion or moment in that story can only best be expressed through song, right? Yeah, it's like something's building, 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 and all of a sudden, I could have danced all night. I could have, like, like yeah, that's the best possible way to, like, say that, right? It's, it's much more appropriate and evocative of the experience to just sing, I could have danced all night, than to just say to somebody, yeah, you know, I could have danced all night, right? So when I got introduced to the world of medicine music through ceremony, I was realizing the same thing applied, you know, that the music can speak, as I said earlier, to the heart and to the mind and, and its ability to kind of bypass a lot of mental constructs much more powerfully than, let's say, you take mushrooms or, you know, LSD or drink ayahuasca, and then somebody tries talking to you for four hours. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be an awful experience because your intellect is engaged the entire time. But if they just put on a really good playlist, you can have a really profound journey, right? And the beautiful teachings through the lyrics of the song are much more accessible, right? Uh, depending on what you're choosing, of course. Yeah, so 
Coming from uh, a Southern Baptist background and understanding the power of gospel music, for instance, to move the ceremony forward, to suddenly put everyone into a collective kind of shared state and emotional space, you know, and from that space, people would have cathartic releases, you know, or from the Southern Baptist uh, tradition, it's like um, experience the Holy Ghost. Right. Or suddenly the music just takes them and they're outside of their body and they're having this beautiful, almost primitive kind of experience. Um, having both a background in that and an understanding later in researching of what's happening just made my relationship with medicine music and the importance of it. Yeah, just much more profound. And I would say like accurate in terms of like someone who writes and produces music, you know, um, I'll say this, you know, related to my own process. Um, the challenging thing is going from a song that is originally conceived of or received in a ceremony setting. We start to develop it there. I teach it to the other crew members. Over, you know, six months or so, we're refining what really works about this particular medicine music. And then when we're ready, we take that into the studio. And my producer is just brilliant, a beautiful man named Jonathan Akakian. Um, his ability to keep intact the medicinal, we'll call it, essence of the song, but also translate it into something that's going to be musically universal and accessible, that's his job and he does it really well. And we kind of, we were experimenting with the Birds in Paradise album on how these high production values would translate into effective medicine music, and they absolutely did. Right? So it became a template for everything I've done since then. Hmm. It's example, interesting you, you, when you hear music in ceremony. Uh, pardon me for interrupting. Uh, just to flush that thought out. An example would be the space that ayahuasca and other plant medicines uh, put you into allow you to hear overtones and different aspects of music, the way they kind of got a woosh, woosh, woosh in the room, and you're hearing not only what you're hearing, but you're also hearing what your mind and psyche is doing with the music, right? Well, the beautiful thing about being in a recording studio is you can duplicate that, right? So, yeah, through instrument choices, effects, you know, and technology, you can actually take a medicine music in a production setting and actually increase its ability to capture outside of the ceremony what it feels like in the ceremony and what it actually sounds like to people, right? Yeah, so we've been playing with that a lot and not pushing the boundary of it too far, but uh, finding the balance has been really, really effective for the music. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting you use that example of, of musical theater where th th there's a moment that, that arises in that experience where the song is seen that it it, it needs to come out or, or it would be better if it came out than, than something else, whether words or, or something right. else. Is that a similar thing that you feel in ceremony? I mean, do, I would imagine there's still some structure you have to, to ceremony with maybe opening songs or closing songs, but but are you also kind of using that same intuition or dynamics of how you're working in ceremony when, when there's a, like a natural moment where the song comes out? Absolutely. You know, it's so beautiful. Um, anyone that facilitates has been doing it a while. You're always in this balance of... The phrase we would use that people that aren't in this world may or may not understand is letting the medicine work through you. It's a term that we use. And what we're really referring to is never imposing something on the ceremony, but deep listening. Like, where is the room at any given moment? Where are people on their journey? Sometimes it feels like, oh, you can feel that this wants to go deeper than it is, but, you know, there might be hesitancy or fear. Maybe there's a lot of new people. So you choose the right song that can open up kind of this portal, right, um, that, yeah, allows the room to go deeper than it was had you not chosen that particular piece of music. The opposite can happen. Let's say the room has been like really deep for a while. People are really doing really you know, deep, grueling, challenging inner work and healing ancestral trauma, depression, whatever the thing, all of it comes up. It's all related. And in that moment, you're like, yeah, I want to lift the energy in the room a bit. Then you choose a song that is kind of like almost gives life to everybody, right? It's like, yeah, and other times, you you know, the most best possible thing is like suddenly I sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat, right? And 
the room laughs not only at the kind of childhood, like, oh, yeah, we grew up with this song, but I've never actually paid attention to life is but a dream. <laughs> right? um, yeah, so the music, similar to what the Icaros are doing, but very different in, for Western people and in neo-shamanic circles, is the music is guiding and facilitating the emotional journey of the ceremony. At any given moment, it's kind of setting the tone for where we're all at collectively. Like, this is a deep, beautiful, reverent moment. This is a challenging moment where deep ancestral or uncomfortable things are coming up, shadow work. Oh, this is a much more, this is a lighter moment. I'm lifting out of that space. Oh, this moment is all about celebrating life and just how beautiful it is to just be together. And then towards the end, it's always much more celebratory. Like, we've all gone through this you know, journey together, and uh, it's been difficult and challenging, but on the other side of it now, there's a beautiful celebration of being alive and being together. All of those things, quite literally, are being dictated by and large by the choices of music being made. Um, the cho Yeah, the choices of the music that you're, you know, orchestrating in any given moment. So going back to the music of theater analogy, it is very similar in that sense. There are moments in the ceremony when either for a particular person or where the room is, you know, the, the most the best possible response is the right song. <laughs> it's like this is the thing that would best express either where we're at or where we'd like to go. Yeah. Hmm. It, it was interesting. You, you, you were saying you, you grew up Southern Baptist. Um and and also interestingly, you know, which is a, a a form of Christianity, and also the the first ayahuasca experience you had was working in the Santo Daime, which, as you said, is also infused with with Judeo Christian archetypes and 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 symbology. Has working with plant medicine given you a different or a, a deeper understanding of of Christianity? I mean, because it, it's interesting. Like even like we were saying that gospel music. I, I mean, it's. Or you, you said someone like in that Southern Baptist experience can be like taken by the experience or, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about people like speaking in tongues even. I mean, th th there's a lot of things in Christianity that if they weren't just considered so normal, we would think that was crazy. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and yet we, we just accept them because that's, that's what, what we do. But I find sometimes it's interesting, you know, because when people do come from another culture to plant work, which is a very different culture from most of the cultures we come from, it often, in a way, takes them back to home. Like, it, it allows them to see their own life or their own uh, kind of upbringing in a much deeper way. And somehow we need to leave home. I mean, that's kind of the archetypal Joseph Campbell hero's journey, that we have to leave home in order to really feel at home. It's the archetypal hero's journey through, yeah, Joseph Campbell's work. It's also, it maps also to the concept of the prodigal son in the Christian tradition, you know? And, you know, like Siddhartha, most of his, uh, the book Siddhartha, you know, uh, Hermann Hesse, um, you know, one of the themes in his books, I think it's particularly Siddhartha. There's another one called, I think, Goldman and Narcissus, great books. They're basically dealing with the same idea that um, these Two men who meet early in their life, their uh, their lives are overlapping. And at one point, I think it's in Goldman and Narcissus, one of them decides to stay in the, like the hermitage, to be a monk. The other goes out into the world and he's just a rascal, you know, you know, sex and debauchery. And he goes through a, a famine and a plague. And at the end of the book, they come back together. And what you realize is they both learn the same things, right? It's through different uh, paths, basically. Um, so yeah, this homecoming thing you talk about is really fascinating. One of the things I love and I share often is one of the things that I really respect and appreciate and most people do about ayahuasca is that it's not a religion, right? Now, in some cultures, yeah, there's more of a, I would say, you know, lack of a better word, there's more of a dogma to it, an idea of tradition, and they really want you to stick to it. But by and large, everything is welcome, you know, uh, whether you're Christian, Buddhist, you know, practicing Zen or yeah, Muslim, whatever it is, you can still fully participate in a ceremony. And if anything, it will deepen your understanding, reverence, and the word would be uh, 
maybe even affection for those traditions because it places them into a context where you can see them more objectively. In some cases, I would say more personally and less from either your over-identification with it or your complete resistance to it, which was my case by the time I started working with ayahuasca. I just decided that the whole Judeo-Christian approach and the, the doctrine and all of it was bullshit. You know, Jesus probably never existed, and even if he did, the whole thing is, like, made up. So I'm in this one ceremony, and there was this beautiful, like, um, I would say, like, a violet violet colored like gaseous cloud kind of hanging out in my visual field and i remember looking at it and right in the moment of me having an inquiry like that's new what's that and this whole dialogue opened up about christ consciousness which is really beautiful and reminding me something that i read many years ago that jesus didn't call himself the christ the christ basically like the term buddha was something that referred to a particular level of consciousness, like a like enlightenment, basically. And in this moment, it, I had this realization. It was like, well, look, I'm bowing down to all these other teachers and traditions. Why not Jesus? Why not Christianity? In other words, why not look to that to see what parts of it ring true and what parts of it are beautiful and what parts of it can be integrated? Yeah, into just the human experience in terms of me, you know, me personally, but in general, and lo and behold, it completely healed my relationship with Christianity. I wasn't, you know, I'm not a card-carrying Christian or consider myself one, um, but I no longer have any issues with that. And the thing that's important to acknowledge for people that are particularly listening to this that probably aren't overly interested in Judeo-Christian or any kind of yeah, um, traditional religion, um, what we're talking about are the teachings themselves, not the stories that have been made up or the way that every one of those traditions has been manipulated and, I would say, weaponized, right? We're talking about the purity and the essence of the, the teachings themselves and most likely, you know, the, the beings. Like, if there is a historical Jesus to the, the degree that we understand these days through amazing documentaries lately, you know, there was this historical figure who most likely was just a pretty advanced, spiritually awake guy during the time, and like everybody who has that experience, in wanting to share this experience with other people, those became teachings. And as we know, most of what Jesus said or did wasn't written down. I think the earliest was 50 years after his death. Most of them were 100 years or so. Before. So I bring that up because this thing happens where you realize, rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater, you realize, ah, there are beautiful gems of the human experience. and teachings of just how to, to be, right, um, that come out of all of these traditions. And if you can look to that instead of the parts of it that you're rejecting, then that can open up for you, basically. And that's what happened with me. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned Narcissus and Goldman. That that was a, a very powerful book for me. Uh, they kind of started me on, on, on my journey, along with Siddhartha. Yeah. I don't know if you remember the final line, I always found it quite quite haunting where he, he turns to him and he says something like, uh, you you can't live or die if you if you don't have a mother. I always found that line quite uh <laughs> yeah. quite haunting. Um Yeah, I love those books relative to our conversation for exactly what we're talking about in beautiful storytelling, beautiful writing. But ultimately, in that book particularly, it was, again, this kind of prodigal son thing where these two men discovered at the end of their lives in reuniting that they both got exactly what they needed and to some degree landed in the same place and learned the same lessons they needed to about life. Just one was a direct experience of the challenge of the human experience. The other was removing oneself from that, right, and going into a more, I don't know, contemplative type of path, yeah. Yeah, and both were equally beautiful and valid. And that's just what the human experience is. You know, I think even most of the, the deep spiritual teachings were responses to the craziness of the human experience. Right? It's like, we have to figure out what's going on. Like, we've got to go internal. We've got to, you know, I was listening to just last night, um, it was a, a YouTube video about uh, the six most dominant philosophers that 
contributed to what became Stoicism, and which is a, having a revival right now, appropriately so. And the thing that was beautiful was understanding that these guys were teaching the basics of how to be a better human and understand the psyche at a time when pain and suffering and violence and war and fam- they were rampant. Right? <laughs> like every time you turned around, somebody was being killed. And I think, well, that's, that's, that was the crucible for it. You know, it's like, there must be a way out of this aspect of the human experience. That there must be something deeper to understand. There have to be like some kind of universal moral access that we can tap into that bypasses the kind of dominant belief of any particular time period. So I think that was the probably origins of a lot of those early traditions. And fortunately, they survived, you know, generations and we have them today. And they're still completely relevant. You know, people that read or hear like uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces, the Bill Moyers, as you know, Joseph Campbell special, that was revolutionary at the time. And I thought it was so interesting that it was revolutionary because he was actually talking about you know, the power of myth and stories that our ancestors have been telling for time memorial, but suddenly framed in a way that they were relevant to contemporary Western culture. And it was revolutionary, you know? And anytime somebody reads that work now, you know, or if they actually, instead of thinking of Carl Jung as kind of this antiquated early, you know, I don't know, founder of what would became, you know, depth psychology. If you really listen to his work, you realize how incredibly ahead of his time this guy was. Like, he's really mapping out the experience with plant medicine and psychedelic psychedelic therapy in a way that once you understand it, you can deepen your experience of either participating in it or facilitating it. Yeah. It's it's interesting that the the guy who I I mentioned Amika uh, another one of the the prophecies of the the Tubu people uh, it's not I guess really a prophecy more than a, a I guess a legend a myth uh, but I think meant to be taken literally as as well as there, there's deep deep symbolism in there but mm-hmm. um but they they say that really humanity suffers and it was kind of interesting that you mentioned that idea too i i think it's a very common thing where we all like to think we live in a unique time and that our, our suffering yeah. is unique and somehow no one in, in the history of the world can understand that and and yet you know as you said jesus was around 2000 years ago buddha was 2500 years or 2500 right. years ago and they were speaking about suffering human suffering <laughs> so people were suffering back then too and we now understand much more than we experience now actually yeah yeah. yeah. Um, but it's interesting because in that Tubu myth, they say that, that eons ago, I, I mean, because also in, in, in a lot of these indigenous systems, I mean, from, from the Amazon, or you think about the Vedas, uh, I mean, the, the depth, the, the history of that, I mean, they're often speaking in terms of eons. They're, they're not even speaking about in, in terms of years or decades or millennia. They're speaking about eons of time. And that even eons ago, the, the reason that humanity was suffering is, according to the Tubu, is because we'd, we'd become orphans of time and space. We'd forgotten who we are and where we come from. And, the, and that's kind of the primordial disconnect. And I think a lot of people, not all, but, but I think a lot of people, and especially people who maybe continue to, to, to work more deeply with plant medicines, it's, it's a very common thing you hear is this idea of remembering and that yeah. somehow in, in remembering there, there's healing, there, there's sanity, there, there's clarity. Um, is, is, is that something that, that has kind of inspired you in your work? Um, you know, because when, when we are drawing on all of these things, you know, like you mentioned, I mean, I think now today, if you listen to, to that Joseph Campbell documentary, I mean, it's revolutionary. I mean, there's real wisdom there that came from... Yeah, yeah. And and, yeah. and and you think like that knowledge is is as old as time. And and so it's it's not necessarily that all of these things are new, that we're you know, we progressed all these amazing ideas. It's you read those stories and there's there's deep, deep wisdom in there that, that by reading it you can remember, by taking plant medicine, you, somehow this this memory of the past is brought up. Yeah. You know, it's like in in the Advaita tradition, you know, non-duality, one of those teachers, Gangaji, once I heard her, you know, this isn't unique to her. She's talking from the teachings of that tradition that 
most of the world's suffering, and she's talking about contemporary world, um, is a result of over-identification with form or over-identification with story. Well, that's you said, that was coming out of the Vedas over eons, right? Uh, most of those, we'll call them now these days, you know, esoteric traditions, they have the exact same message that kind of perennially keeps coming up for each generation because each generation needs to hear it again because we do fall into this amnesia, you know, and before you know it, and apparently now, um, more than ever, because of the you know, what's new for this generation, our overlapping generations, is social media. And young people more than ever are feeling isolated, disconnected from each other and the natural world, their place in the cosmos, and over-identified with, yeah, persona and story and what other people are doing. And then, you know, you, you go on some kind of spiritual quest and you start encountering these teachings and you're right they're saying the exact same thing over and over because it needs to be said over and over to every generation and every new human on the planet a reminder and it is a remembering right of a deeper sense of who you are a deeper sense of your place in the cosmos the journey that you're on being able to put your your life in the context of myth something like the hero's journey. As Joseph Campbell says, that the role of the myth is to teach us how to orient ourselves to life. You know, it's a way to understand what it actually is and how to travel through it in a way that's, you know, beneficial for you and for other people and how to be a good human, basically. Um, yeah, those are, that's why I think even now when people listen to it, and a friend of mine just did recently, um, her understanding about what Joseph Campbell was saying in the Bill Moyer special, she said, was revolutionary for her. And one of the moments I really like is he says something like, so I'm combining two things. I watched this documentary once. It was like History of Christianity or something. It was the first one that really took a really beautiful, objective kind of view of it. And then one of these guys that says in the documentary, he said, we used to think the problem was that the contemporaries of Jesus heard what he was saying literally, and today we're hearing it metaphorically. He said, what we learn in the course of this documentary is that the opposite is true. His contemporaries knew that he was talking in metaphor and myth, but today we're hearing it as if they're actual fact, right? And liter literal. And so there's that piece. And then in Joseph Campbell, in that special, remember at one point he says something like, he said, if you read the Bible factually and you hear something like, oh, this great flood happened, he goes, well, so what? It was like a news story. You know, 2,000 years ago, a flood happened. He said, but when you hear it from the place of metaphor and what you can learn and the teachings from that, suddenly the Bible opens up into a, a beautiful uh, tool for teaching, right? Of, again, how to orient oneself to life, you know, how to have an authentic sense of a moral axis of what's valuable, what isn't. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that's why those teachings are, I think that's why they will remain for eternity, for humans as revolutionary when you're hearing it the first time, depending on the culture that you're in, because some cultures never kind of step outside of that. But for Western culture, I say specifically, yeah, when people start a plant medicine path, you know, or let's say they take LSD with friends on a weekend and suddenly, you know, oh my gosh, everything's connected. It's like, yeah, that's revolutionary in that moment for you, right? And then you start reading other texts and, you know, words of spiritual teachers and you realize like, oh, wow, that revolution, I, a revelation I just had on LSD, some guy was writing about that exact experience 3,000 years ago. <laughs> I think it's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful I mean, to know that there's a continuity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that kind of segues to, to, to this question. I mean, you, I was listening to another podcast you do, and, and you mentioned you, you're kind of stepping into this role of an elder now, which, uh, you know, is always yeah. a, an interesting title to, to take on. And, you know, I mean, even kind of as we were talking about, I mean, we, we live in a culture which which really does, I, I think, put a, an overemphasis on, on youth, on, on things like biohacking, on these very fast ways of doing things. And, and, and I think especially in this work, or really any work, I mean, there is no substitute for time, for experience, for, for getting your hands dirty, for, for rolling up your sleeves. And 
what is what has that been like from from discovering the ayahuasca through the Santa Daime thirty five years ago? And you know, I, I would imagine to to some degree you, you you kind of were in that that California kind of culture, which was also very interested in spirituality and and mm -hmm. looking at, at different ways of living and and then through a time of you know the war on drugs where everything is demonized and, yeah. and just all the, the 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 horror that that's come from that to now this time where i mean even when i started this work uh, if i use that word ayahuasca no one had any idea what i was talking about to now if i use that word it's every, you know Everybody people told me about their last ceremony in, in brooklyn right. Um, so what has that arc been like to, to where, you know, now, as you said, it's this phrase is being used that, that we live in this psychedelic renaissance and, and, you know, it's almost the pendulum swung to the other way to where it, it's become such a part of our society now to, to where I think some people are even having to push back to say like, wait a minute, like maybe we need to slow down or maybe we don't have a right understanding of these things or, or maybe there are real harms to these and, and they need to be spoken about. I mean, what has that been like of, of your life and, and, and where, where you see the world at now and, and, and how these plants have become so, you know, still, I'm sure there's a long way to go, but, but how they've, they've become integrated in society and, and if you have any ideas of, of where that's moving towards. Yeah, it's such a big, big topic, you know, that's, oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many conversations I've been in over the last few years about this so-called psychedelic renaissance. Um, so I, there are two kind of dominant thoughts, and I agree with both of them. Um, one is that there is a psychedelic renaissance, um, meaning that there is an initial, we'll say like, you know, the the initial introduction of plant medicines and psychedelics to the West from the 60s, that we weren't, to some degree, fully capable of managing or understanding a whole other conversation um, that had to go underground. And now with a deep understanding and maturity as a culture of what they can bring, we're in this renaissance of that. So to that degree, psychedelic renaissance is really accurate. There's another school of thought, and I agree with this one too, that the psychedelic renaissance is actually just kind of late stage capitalism in this sense, that it's commodified. And not only that, it's being used by a lot of people as like, everybody else is doing it, this is a trendy thing that's in, or this is a great new market, there's lots of money and power and prestige and position to be had in the world of psychedelics and plant therapy, uh, plant medicine therapy. Um, so there's a part of it that you could say the psychedelic renaissance is predominantly just another capitalism meets an ancient tradition and figures out how to monetize it and, you know, co-opt it. And so, so that's also true. At the same time, we're at a very unique, I love what you said earlier, you know, each generation thinks that their particular suffering or challenges are unique. And you look back at like, you know, just the history of Rome and you realize like we got it easy, right? Compared to what was happening during, as the world was shaping itself. At the same time, this is the first generation that has the power to destroy life as we know it, right? We're dealing with a power, I think, talking predominantly about technology that is new. And certainly in the West, it's in the hands of a lot of people who's emotional and maybe we'll just say spiritual maturity is uh, not, we'll use that word maturity, not mature enough to handle the genie that's being let out of the bottle. We can see that everywhere, including things like AI, right? The technologies in and of themselves are amazing and inevitable, but what we do with them is everything. And I feel like this is where the, the, the bridging, as your, your teacher said, you know, these uh, bridging of these four directions, if we can marry the understandings of these time-tested, beautiful teachings, not exclusively, but I would say probably more predominantly from indigenous uh, peoples, if we can apply what we know about who we actually are, what we're capable of, what works and doesn't work, basically wisdom, speaking to the elder card, and you, you have to marry that with technology and understanding the the power and positive and negative 
potentialities of the technologies that we're dealing with. In that sense, I feel like this absolutely is a psychedelic renaissance. I feel like there's no mistake that in a lot of ways, people are saying, you know, religion has failed us, right? In terms of like what its promises are. Um, and to some degree, maybe science has too. So you have a lot of people that I think are just kind of an ongoing existential crisis of, you know, having life be meaningful and purposeful. And yeah, I just read, you know, they, there's more people that committed suicide, I think, in the last 10 years that died in all the wars, something like that combined. That's probably a hyperbolic statement, but it's relatively true. And you look at that and you think, okay, yeah, culture, modern society, capitalism, free market, you know, democracy, all those things, as beautiful as they are in essence, haven't kept thousands of people from wanting to kill themselves every year, right? So we have to look at that and say, what is not working? What's wrong with that? I think what's not, what's missing is this piece we're talking about. It's these time-tested teachings uh, from lived experience, you know, from various cultures that keep passing down to each, gen each generation. It doesn't matter whether you're on an you know, you're working on an abacus or you've got an iMac. Like, there are certain things that are going to be universally true, regardless of where we're at in the evolution of the human species, right? Yeah, and I feel the psychedelic renaissance is also that. It's also the result of a lot of people looking for answers, realizing that there's something deeper and more profound, you know, and more beautiful about life than materialism, basically, right? Um, so I, for me, that's what I think of when I think of the psychedelic renaissance. I think it's more of globally, because obviously it's not happening everywhere, but in general, you could say that globally, people are realizing that like, there's got to be something else. We're missing something here. You know, why are we still at war? You know, why are people killing themselves? Why is there so much pain and suffering? Why are people starving in the richest company or country in the world? And why are so many people, you know, lining up at the borders to try to get out of a country they're in and into this one or some other country? Um, I feel like the the mythologies and the esoteric teachings and, you know, to a large degree, the, the true essence of the spiritual, even Judeo-Christian religions, that's what they that's what they speak to. That's the part that I think a lot of people are yearning for and have missed. And face it, you know, for better or worse, the plant medicine and psychedelic approach to that can be a fast track they you know which makes them both beautiful potent and dangerous right um there's this phrase that i'm sure you've heard in the world that you're in that it's so accurate you know um i'm forgetting how it's said all the time but mostly it's something like in an ayahuasca ceremony 10 years of psychod or of of like doing therapy can be 10 minutes right and it's true what it can take 10 years sitting on a mountaintop, you know, practicing chants and Buddhist teachings or what you can get from being a psychoanal psychoanalyzed for 10 years. You can go into one plant medicine ceremony if you have the intention to do so and cover the same ground. Right. Um, so that's also what I think is a, a strong component of the psychedelic renaissance is that to me, it feels like it's arising right on time. As if humanity is kind of racing towards the edge of a, a cliff to throw themselves off of, we have these technologies that can disrupt that and in a relatively short period of time cause a complete reset, you know? Um, yeah, kind of stop you in your tracks, reorient yourself to who you are, your role in life, your connection to the cosmos. And I think for a lot of people, yeah, it quite literally is like getting a reset. And although a lot of the older contemplative traditions had those components, the way that they evolve would take years of sitting in a practice or a guru to attain. The, I think the cool thing about this particular generation, and again, there's always like three of them overlapping, is that a lot of really earnest and intelligent people have kind of reverse engineered those states and figured out much more effective and efficient ways, particularly for Western people, to achieve that. First is breath work. You know, there was initially just the importance of breathing, but now we understand the actual science of breath and what it does. Um, another example would be, you know, like related to the breath work. You know, we now know that 
if you take longer exhalations and inhalations, you can trigger the vagus nerve, which triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. It tells basically your body, like, calm down, we got this. You know, those are all really powerful tools that I think in the past we may not have had, we may not have had complete understanding for or direct language enough to, in combining them all, you can lead someone on a journey of transformation that can take two or three years, sometimes two or three months. What in the past might have taken them a lifetime of searching and sitting again on mountaintops to achieve. So that's also part of the psychedelic renaissance, I think. It's really just this new contemporary understanding of the technology behind a lot of those practices, why they're important and how to kind of evolve them and upgrade them so they meet people where they're at now. Yeah. And the world where it is now, you know. Well, beautiful, Tony. I, I know we need to, to to cut out here pretty soon. Um, maybe to, to to leave you with a final question. It's it, it's something kind of related to that, and it's it's something that again I, I think many years ago really wasn't a thing. But but I also find it more and more too, where you know you mentioned especially young people where they're 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 feeling very unhappy, anxiety, depression, suicide. And and I think these plants are really calling to young people. And I think with that, a lot of young people are really looking for paths, for for mentors, for for apprenticeships, and 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 how to really do this. And yet, it's still, it's a very strange field in that way, and that there aren't still very concrete ways of beginning to do this work. There's not, in general, like a four year university you go to with a degree in plant medicine work or shamanism. Yeah. And I, I heard something really beautiful you, you mentioned in one of your podcasts, and, and you were saying that, that this, there's this real power and beauty and blessing of, of having someone like just sit in front of you and say, hey, Tony, like, I think you'd be really good at this. Or, or you know, I, I kind of give you the authority to do this. And, and that there's a real power to that. And, and, and I think something that people are looking for, but they... Again, I think a lot of young people just don't know what to do. So I, I think the question is, what do you, what do you recommend to young people who, who maybe are feeling in despair, they, they want to work with plants, or maybe they're feeling amazing and they just feel really called to actually doing this work, to holding space for it, and, but they, they just they have no idea where to, where to start? Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that has so dramatically shifted and what's unique about the time period we're in is social media and internet, you know? I mean, if I could have gone on the internet prior to my first ayahuasca experience and saw available what there is today, that experience would have been very, very different for me, you know? Um, yeah, and it's interesting you brought a thing about the four-year university because actually that that is true now. Like you, schools like CIIS, you know, um, the Naropa Institute, you actually can get de degrees in yeah, relatively speaking, shamanism, psychedelic therapy, slash plant medicine, you know, and they're good programs. You know, I've, I've checked them out and I've, I've met some amazing people that have taken them and um, they're powerful. And what's cool is they're basically just pulling together all the knowledge of thousands of years, you know, of what works and doesn't work and the technology of it, kind of reverse engineering it and teaching you what you need to know if this is something that you're interested, you know, in pursuing. And that said, that doesn't trump, as you brought up earlier, the the years of experience it just takes from actually sitting with really good teachers, you know, and understanding and experiencing the traditions that are still available firsthand. So when people ask me, young people, you know, advice on how to move into that, you know, it sounds like not the best advice, but I've learned that it is. I'm like, you start by... It's like being an autodidact in this sense. It's like go on the internet and you Google the things you're interested in. Like, what is shamanism? What is plant medicine? Um, that literally just starts taking you down the rabbit hole of all the possibilities and perspectives, everything from traditional indigenous worldviews to contemporary understandings of it. But in that, I think you do find you've, you're fitting and you start... What opens up is which aspect of it that you're actually interested in, you know? And within that, bringing our conversation full circle, as I started with, this idea of when the student is ready, the teacher will, will appear. Um, this elder aspect, you know, you brought up with me, 
Um, the podcast you're referring to, I had an amazing uh, good friend and teacher and mentor. His name was Russell. And he was the first person, an adult male that sat across from me. And basically, this is not what he said, but this is what was translated. It's like, I see you. You know, like you have incredible potential. Um, and he basically gave me both kind of the permission and the inspiration and the confidence that I had the ability to do what it was that I was kind of starting to intuit is what I wanted to do, you know, which was to find a way to use music and plant medicine to, as I've said before, basically to help with the expansion of human consciousness. Because at that moment in my life, it was kind of a, you know, the existential crisis of the world is like completely you know, gone crazy. And if we don't find a way to evolve our consciousness soon, we're going to, you know, destroy ourselves. And I knew that I wanted my life to somehow contribute and participate in that. So having an adult male who I trust to sit across from me and basically say, yes, this is a, a worthy you know, investment of your life and that you have the ability to do it. That's what launched me. And then he was just introducing me very skillfully to like, he was like, oh, what are you reading? And I would tell him, oh, well, try this book next. Oh, you probably want to try this. Oh, so-and-so is in town. They're doing a lecture. You might want to go. He was very, very hands-off. And at the same time, always kind of judging where I was and realizing like, this would be a next step for you. Like, take that thing and expand upon it. So with young people, though, the I think the most valuable thing I can share is to find a good teacher, right? And that might not be like a teacher. I mean, it might be, I'm very interested in ayahuasca. Look online, check around, find a place in Peru that's offering really good three-week, you know, kind of dive into the introduction of it. If they're reputable and they have a good reputation, and most of them now do, you can read, you know, <laughs> reviews. Um, that's really a good place to start because you just have to immerse yourself into the plant medicine psychedelic therapeutic you know, community world to even start to kind of see what's available on the horizon, basically. So I always find what's most important overall is finding someone that you trust, that other people trust. And basically, you know, this is a good place to end. There's something that put this elder card you talked about, or me, I, I, I call it occasionally pulling the elder card. Moving into eldership, um, something that is lost apparently in the world that throughout history was quite alive was this idea of seeking out a teacher, right? Um, or like patrons. Like if you were an artist or some kid that had engineering or scientific skills, you know, some person with money and resources would recognize that and kind of take you on, right? They wanted because they realized this is a contribution to society that I'm going to invest in you, basically. Um, so a lot of young people I find have lost this, I don't know the word would be, like possibility that you can actually seek out good teachers and actually contact them and say, hey, I would actually like to study with you. You know, I would like to learn like what's possible. I feel like that's one of the most beautiful gifts you can give a young person is that understanding that. You're not on your own. There are always people who have, you know, treasured along and been on the path longer than you have. And if you find a good one, you know, you have the ability to say, you know, I would like to learn from you, whether it's just something in this moment or a long period of time. And that was the thing with me accepting the elder thing. I knew that I had reached that stage because more and more young people were coming to me and actually saying, is there a way to work with you? Like, to actually like learn and study. And I remember thinking like, I'm still an idiot student myself, you know, but at the same time, like, no, actually I need to like transition in my life. I am now in this place where for a lot of people, I'm definitely either like a spiritual teacher or an elder. And there's this beautiful moment in the various stages of life when you take that on, not just kind of by default, like, oh, I'm an elder. It's like, no, this is a huge responsibility and a gift. Right. And if this is where I'm moving into, into in my life, I want to be a really good one. I want to be the kind of elder for young people that my teacher was for me. And there are there are several of them, but I was thinking of the one because I mentioned him. Even in I remember in high school and elementary school, yeah, you know, we all have them. There's just one teacher in this one moment that said or did one thing that changed the trajectory of your life. And I've never forgotten it. And I realize that each of us has that moment, you know, particularly working with young people, like what might be like a 10 minute chance encounter, you know, the casual for you, I find out later someone just recently told me that 
something that I said to them 10 years ago changed their life. And I don't even remember the conversation. But I remember when they told me what I said, my response was, that sounds like something I would say. <laughs> yeah, so for me, the elder card, and tying this into what you're asking about young people, I think it is to not underestimate that time-tested tradition of someone younger seeking out a mentor. Yeah, and that mentor taking on the the beautiful, I think, uh, opportunity and responsibility of being that for somebody else. Yeah. Well, amazing, Tony. Thank you so much. That, that, that's a beautiful answer, and, and I think a great way to end it. I, I think uh, I could talk to you for another couple hours. There's there's a, a lot of questions we could we could go into, but thank you so much. Um, if if people are are interested in, in in your music and your work, how how is the best way of them finding you or contacting you? I try to stay current with what I'm up to through my website, which is just my name, Tony Moss dot me. And I'm generally, whatever latest podcasts or upcoming things are happening, um, I, I, I try to keep it current. <laughs> so, but it's a good place to have basically everything from the music to what's happening with like public appearances and so forth. They're usually on that site. Yeah. All right. Great. Great. Well, we'll put that in the show notes too. And thank you. I, I appreciate your time and, and everything you're doing and, and just your wisdom and, and all of the work you're, you're helping to bridge and create. And, um, and let's see, maybe our paths will cross, uh, in, in Peru in a couple months and, and who knows, maybe we even do a round two, but, uh, but I really appreciate your, your time, Tony, and I appreciate thank you me. as a person and, and thank you for sharing. Uh, ditto. Same. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. That's it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, it was really a pleasure and, and even an honor to, to have Tony come on. He's, uh, as we kind of talked about in the podcast, I think rightfully so, taken on this this role of, a, of an elder, someone who's uh, been around this work for a, a really long time. And as I mentioned in the, the podcast, um, in this time of, of kind of biohacking and, and bypassing and, and just trying to do things really quickly, uh, there, there truly is no substitute for, for time, for experience, for, for knowledge, for uh, really walking a path and, and everything that just really time and, and effort and, and repetition teaches people. And so um, I, I really honor the fact that he's been doing this for so long. It's a, it's a testament to, to his will and character. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, it was a pleasure for me. As always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really beautiful option. It's a website and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Also, those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, a uh, chance to ask questions. Um, to all the people supporting that way, to all the patrons, as always, thank you very much for your support. And if you're able to do that, that's really uh, the main way that allows me to continue uh, making this podcast. So, uh, uh, if you're not able to do that, as always, helping to drive the algorithms is uh, also really helpful. So if you're viewing this on YouTube or Rumble, um, uh, subscribing to the channel, uh, liking the video, um, leaving any questions or comments in the comment section are all really helpful. And then if you're listening to this on whatever platform, um, uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify are, are still the big ones. Leaving a starred rating and a short review is also very helpful. So I think that's it. Um, I mentioned in the beginning, but myself and Marav have a few retreats coming up. We just finished here in Portugal, uh, and we have uh, uh, Plantietta August in Canada, and November we'll be back in the Sacred Valley of Peru. So if you're interested in working with us, you can find uh, more info on my website, Nicotiana Rustica, and Marav's site, TobaccoDiets.com, and I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. So that's it. Um, I'm not sure of my upcoming guests. I've reached out to a few people who I've been wanting to, to bring on the podcast, so hopefully the, that will line up. Um, but as always, I hope to continue to, to bring on really fascinating guests. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope this finds you all well, and I will see you all on the next episode. Tum